Yes, great. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I've got the pleasure of uh, introducing Neil Chu Hong from the Software Sustainability Institute, who's agreed to come and talk to us about software licensing. Um, so I'll leave it up to you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, I'd like to extend my uh, kind of like welcome. Thank you for coming along to listen to what might well be one of the uh, most boring and yet most interesting at the same time subjects that you can get around software. Um, how many of you were here the last time I came about two and a half years ago? No, good. So you've not heard this before. This is, this is excellent. Um, so I, I have uh, a variety of material prepared going through an introduction to software licensing um, and some of the different kind of use cases that you might need to know about. Um, I'm happy to tailor this material and take questions. I'm also happy, um, I know we've got this theatre till about uh, two o'clock, so what I'll try and do is talk for about 40 minutes and then take some questions, and I'm also happy to take questions outside if you have specific things you're, you're looking to talk um, about. Uh, the one thing that would be really useful for me to understand is of the people in the room, um, who, who is developing software? Okay, all right. Who's managing the development of software? Okay, and um, who is providing advice to people um, who are either developing software or managing software? Right, okay. Um, anyone that didn't fall into one of those three categories? Yeah, okay, so, so um, a quick check. What's your interest in this, in this workshop? Is it, um, yeah? I, I write my own scripts. Okay. Eventually they might go out in public, but... Okay, excellent. Um, software development. Okay. Same with the people out there as well. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this um, one thing. One thing that um, I should say is that uh, the advice I'll, I'll be giving um, applies to people who are just starting out. So if you are just writing scripts for yourself, uh, all the way through to if you have a large um, project with multiple partners, um, software licensing affects everyone who uses software at some point. And even if you think that it's still very early days, it's always useful to have enough knowledge to know what you should be doing next. Uh, so I hope that all of you managed to get something from this, this talk. Um, these slides, are, I, I'm trying something a little bit different. So over the last year or two, um, I give a number of different types of talks in this kind of workshop style uh, that uh, I'll go out to different universities, different places, and so on. So, for instance, this talk um, we're, uh, is going to be taken next to a group of Roman archaeologists uh, at one of the big um, archaeology conferences that's happening um, next month. Uh, and I'm trying to make all of this, uh, we're talking about licensing, so all of these materials and slides are available under a Creative Commons license, which is a common license for sharing open data. You can also use it for sharing other open materials like slides, like exercises and so on. And if you're interested in, um, if, you, if you find this subject really scintillating, you're passionate about it like I am, uh, what you can do is take these materials and use them yourself and give this talk yourself to, uh, to people who are closer to you in your own group, your collaborators. Um, if you'd like any help with that, please let me know. Um, and if you think there are mistakes in these t talks, which there might be, let me know. You can um, do this on GitHub, which is where these slides are. So, um, I'm Neil Chu Hong. I'm the director of the uh, Software Sustainability Institute. And what the Software Sustainability Institute is, is an organization that supports researchers um, develop and use software better. Um, so we do this in many different ways. Sometimes it's directly with researchers. Sometimes it's with uh, people who uh, assist researchers within the library or the IT services. And sometimes it's trying to understand how we change policy around the way that things are done. Um, so the important thing here, I guess, is to understand that um, what we're trying to do is make your lives easier. So um, if we're not, let us know, because um, that would be a bit of a problem. Um, 
Uh, and I need to say that this work has been funded by a whole load of different people, um, primarily from the research councils, um, and that I sh uh, I'd like to say thanks to my uh, colleague Shoaib Sufi um, and also a number of other organisations which I will mention later in the resources section who also provide free advice to people and um, I urge you to, to kind of look at their advice if you're after more detail. Okay, so yes... Um, People get very concerned about licensing. They get very scared about licensing. Um, they, they basically, um, licensing is often seen as something which is really um, difficult. It's seen as something which is very alien and so on. So feel free to put in your own favourite word into this slide. Um, but what I'm trying to do is... Um, kind of give you an overview of what licensing is and give you some examples of how it will affect you in your day-to-day -day life. However, this is the mandatory slide that anyone who talks about software licensing will put up unless they are a lawyer. Um, I am not a lawyer. Um, I am only giving opinion, not advice. So this is one of the reasons why people get very scared about software licensing is because everyone puts up a slide like this and saying that they're not providing advice. Uh, what I mean here is I'm providing advice that should not be used um, to sue me in court. So <laughs> as long as you're okay with that, that's fine. Um, there are some people who are lawyers who provide advice. Um, and so uh, particularly the first three of these um, resources here, so the International Free and Open Source Law Book, um, Q Legal, who are based at um, uh, Queen Mary University in London um, and TLODR Legal, they all provide um, advice which has been vetted by lawyers. So if you're interested in the legal opinion, that's where you can find that. Um, the other um, thing that I would like to point out is um, Open Source Software Watch. Uh, you'll notice a lot of these things say open source on them. Actually, um, most of the advice that they give here on software licensing is very relevant if you're um, you doing closed source um, software as well. As I hope you'll find out, uh, a lot of the, the advice and opinion that I will give you is relevant for all software projects, no matter what type of licensing you're using. So um, be aware that... Uh, Although you'll see open source come up a lot, the main reason that that is there is simply because they have published more materials that are openly available to people. So um, I will point to a lot of those resources because they're easier for you to get to rather than because they don't apply to um, other types of project. So um, what I'm going to try and do uh, in about 30 minutes is give an introduction to licensing and IP, um, talk a little bit about software licenses and why they're important, um, give you some examples of the types of licenses and how to choose between them, uh, and lastly, give you an idea of the difference between licensing and governance, because I think that's a very important distinction to make. People get very... Um, worried about the license they choose, but actually when we talk about licensing, it's probably more important to work out how you deal with governance on your software development, particularly once you move from beyond it just being you developing code for yourself. Um, if you want, I can also talk about some other topics, um, things like research funder expectations, license compatibility, um, potentially business models, and persuading your boss as well. So. Uh, these are things that I can certainly answer in questions, um, and as I said, if you have any other questions, do let me know, and they'll probably get added to a future version of this talk. So, um, the first thing, though, is introducing licensing and intellectual property. Who here believes they know what a, a license is? Okay, good, that's good. Uh, who, who knows what intellectual property is? <laughs> Um, who knows what the difference is? <laughs> ah, okay. So, um, uh, licensing, licensing is actually something that you come across uh, a lot. Um, licensing is basically official permission to do something with some limits. So, um, very ones that you'll come across every day. Um, uh, pubs need to be licensed, so there is a licensing act that says what they can and can't do and what you as a patron can and can't do in a pub. So uh, a good example of how license um, might affect you if you were going to a restaurant or a pub is when you can drink alcohol 
or when you can have children in the premises. Um, likewise, if you're playing live music, um, how many people drive cars? Okay, you know the little thing in your pocket, the driving license? There's an example of a license. It is basically something that gives you official permission to do something. Um, and in most cases, uh, you'll, you'll be able to drive a vehicle of a certain size with a certain number of seats. So almost all of us would be able to drive a car if we have a driving license, but not an articulated lorry um, or a very large bus. Um, and the reason why we, have, uh, we care about licenses to do with intellectual property is that we often use licenses to exploit intellectual property. So intellectual property is kind of what the words make it sound like. It is the encapsulation of someone's ideas. Um, so whether or not that is um, a creative work or whether it is a derived work, so something you've made um, based on something else, it is, it is something that encapsulates a set of ideas. Um, so for instance, if I take a photograph of you all, um, that might be considered a piece of intellectual property, although there are all sorts of other problems to do with me trying to take a picture of you all. Um, uh, but I might say uh, to um, a, another company that you can use the photograph I've taken to advertise your product, but only in the United Kingdom. So again, it's like official permission from me to another organization um, under contract law here uh, to do something with a certain scope. Um, likewise, uh, I, I come from a background of cinemas, um, so I have a lot of knowledge around film exhibition law, and one of the big ones that people always ask me is, why can't I just buy um, a DVD from the shop and show it in my community hall? And the answer is because there are licenses to do with films. Um, so you can only screen a film to a public audience if you have a license to do so. And that license restricts you to a particular venue and to a particular date. So licensing is something you come up with all of the time. Um, what you might start getting confused about is people start um, create, kind of like coming up with all sorts of other terms. Um, to, that are related to intellectual property. So you might hear about things like patents, um, copyrights, uh, and you're, you might question like how all do all of these different things interrelate? Um, so uh, what's the difference between a patent and a copyright? Um, what does it mean to give a license uh, around that? And I don't propose we go into this very much. If you really, really are interested in this, then talk to me afterwards over, over tea. Um, all I think that's important to, um, to, to get out of this is an understanding that in software, it's, it's the same as with other kinds of creative works. What you're talking about is understanding who owns the IP, so that who, who has the tangible ownership of the, of the thing that has been created. So in this case, a piece of software, um, but it also applies perhaps to a data set or a model that you might be creating or indeed a document. Um, and then what needs to happen for other people to use it? And that really is the, uh, the sort of just the summary of licensing. It's understanding who owns it and what they um, are doing to let other people use it. So um, why is software licensing important? Um, there are a lot of common fallacies out there. So um, one which applies in particular to creative works like f photos is this idea that if you find it on the internet, you can just automatically use it. Because in making it available to others freely, um, and I use freely um, in a loose sense, uh, you have given anyone permission to reuse it. Uh, that's not the case, and it's the same thing for software. So if you publish software on your web page, um, you are not automatically giving people the rights to use it freely. Um, there was one um, important case uh, a, a little while back um, for the Java programming language where Sun, um, uh, the people who uh, were at the time uh, maintaining the Java language, published a piece of code on their website that they expected everyone to use. It was a key piece for doing certain types of um, user interface uh, design um, implementations, but they hadn't put a license on it. 
So anyone who used that piece of code could, in theory, even though Sun were wanting it to be widely used, um, uh, get sued by Sun for, for breach of copyright. Um, and that kind of leads on to the next one. So um, another common fallacy is by not putting a license onto your software or onto your, other, your photo or so on, um, that it's all fine. Um, but actually, that's, that can be worse than having a really restrictive license because it's confusing for people. People don't know whether or not what you meant to do was make it really open so that everyone can use or meant it to be really closed so that only you could use it. Um, and that's why uh, even when you're starting off um, as a person developing a single piece of code for themselves, you should think about putting on a license from the start, uh, even if that is a very close one, the equivalent of saying all rights reserved, which basically means only I get to say what to do with it. Um, because, um, and we'll get onto this a little bit later, you can change. If, you're, uh, if you are the owner of the IP, if you are the owner of the copyright, um, you can change your license later on. And the last one is um, you automatically own the IP or the copyright to your creations. Um, I know Cambridge is slightly different um, in that many staff contracts mean that um, the, you as a researcher, as the originator of the ID, idea, own the copyright to it. Uh, but that's not the case in many other universities. So where I'm based at the University of Edinburgh, um, my employer, the University of Edinburgh, owns the copyright for work I do um, paid for under my contract at ours. Um, indeed, some, in some cases, you may have an employer which goes even further and says, I own the copyright for anything I, uh, you do that involves the resources that, um, uh, that the, the employer's provided, which can be difficult because in many cases, we might read email um, on a work machine that is personal and so on. Uh, so, that's often something that's very important to understand. Uh, and the thing to look at there is look at your staff contracts, um, ask your HR department, they may not know. Um, but if that's the case, uh, get someone else to help. That's something where we, we can maybe come in. Um, uh, but on the other side, the things that you're normally trying to do with software licensing are, are around the exploitation of the ideas you've generated. So you might want to sell your work, um, and a license would allow you to set out those sort of conditions. You might want to let others reuse your work, um, particularly as a researcher, you're interested in furthering um, the common knowledge. Uh, or you might like to exploit it for a company, uh, and choosing the right license here, again, will help you exploit uh, your work outside of the university. So. There's those sort of things. So there are a lot of fallacies around licenses, but also there are a lot of uh, ways in which licenses can help you do what you would like to do. Um, and that's really what I'd like to talk to uh, you about. So um, the problem is that when we talk about licenses, people often think it is very hard. So how many of you have chosen a software license before? OK. Um, how did you go about it? Did you just look at, look at what other people were doing? Did you make a conscious choice based on how you wanted uh, people to um, use your software? Yeah. So, so that's, really, that's really the thing. It's actually quite easy to choose a license. But what is hard to do is, is to think about why different licenses help you in different ways. Um, so there are lots of different types of licenses. Um, you will probably have seen some of these. Uh, so for instance, when I say something like a closed license, what I mean is the kind of license you, you get on shrink-wrapped products that you might buy somewhere, or indeed now might uh, be, uh, be kind of downloaded from a software site. So um, common examples, uh, Microsoft Office is something which has a, co uh, a closed and proprietary license. Um, there's another category called restricted licenses, often known as academic or non-commercial licenses, commonly used um, on older uh, scientific codes, where the idea is that if you're an academic, you can use the software for free. Uh, but if you're a company, you have to pay a license. Um, uh, so a good example of that, a lot of computational chemistry software uses uh, those kind of licenses. Um, 
You can have open licenses, so open source licenses, and those, generally speaking, fall into two different categories. Um, there are the ones which are all about making sure that people share modifications, um, often known as copyleft or viral licenses. Um, and they're the ones that are really about making um, your software as widely available as possible, um, so the permissive licenses. And then finally, you might have heard of something called public domain and putting it into a public domain. That's you basically saying, I am giving up my copyright. I am saying that this is something that now anyone has a claim over. Uh, and there's also a related license called Creative Commons Zero. Um, in general, Creative Commons licenses cannot be used for software, but the Creative Commons Zero um, license is often used for software that people want to put into the public domain. Um, finally, there are informal licenses uh, uh, where you basically write something that creates a contract between you and other people. It's a type of closed or proprietary license but it's basically one that's not been checked by a, uh, by a lawyer, which is a bad thing. Um, or you can put no license, as I said, um, which is often confusing. So really the question you have to ask yourself is, to choose a license, what do you want people to do with your software? Uh, and that can be really hard sometimes. So understanding what you want, to, what you want people to do with your software in the near future is really um, difficult. Understanding what you want people to do with your software in two to three years' time can be even harder. But it's worthwhile thinking about it because this isn't just about licensing. This is really about understanding uh, where you think uh, you are taking your work. So, for instance, you might have a piece of software which you're writing to um, simply convert between two different data formats. You might think there that that's something that only you will use, and then you discover that one of your collaborators is trying to do exactly the same thing. So you want to give that script to them to use as well. All of a sudden, you've gone from one scenario where it's something that you expected just to use once and throw away to something where someone else is using it. And those are the kind of considerations that you're looking to understand um, when you are trying to work out what um, impact your software will have. Um, so things you should be looking at are things like, does your software depend on other software? Um, so if you are building on top of other libraries, if you are incorporating code from other people, um, you may have restrictions on the types of licenses you can use. So it's important to know whether this is something that you are doing entirely from scratch or something where you are building on the work of others. You should think about the type of impact you want to have with your um, your work. Is this something where your main aim is to achieve widespread usage? Is it to try and get commercial revenue? Um, is it to make sure that people can assess the validity of your research outcomes? Is it to create cultural change? Um, fifth one that I didn't put on there, but um, some people want to do this because they want to achieve fame and worldwide reputation. So think about the type of it, uh, impact you're seeking because your license will help you do this in different ways. Um, you should think about whether you, you care whether changes that have been made by other people are made available. Um, this is particularly the case for open source licenses um, where you want to understand uh, what other people can do with your work uh, and how they can adapt it. Um, and the other thing you want to look at is are there certain people or organizations um, that you don't want to use your software? Um, I, this is a thorny issue. So again, in the world of computational chemistry, for instance, um, there is one piece of software which has a license that prevents its usage by certain um, organizations. So if you work at a university that is on the blacklist, you can't use that software. I think that's... A, that's not a good way to go for scientific software, but a license could let you do that. Um, there are other licenses that say uh, people cannot use it from certain countries. Again, I think that's a terrible thing to do, um, but if you really want to do that, make sure you thought about it. Um, there are some other considerations, which I, I, I won't go into, into a lot of detail about, um, but one of them that I'm going to come back to is this idea of dual licensing and relicensing. 
Um, and the reason I'm going to say that is that a lot of the reasons why people uh, get worried about uh, the choice of a software license is because they believe it will place restrictions on what they can do in the future with the software. Um, and the, the kind of ideas of dual licensing and relicensing are a way of ensuring that you can um, effectively change your mind uh, in certain ways and, and do different things with the software uh, as you go forward. So, um, the question that often comes up is, so you've chosen a license, but actually how do you license software? Uh, it's really quite easy. So to license software, all you need to do is basically tell people that it is following a certain license. Um, so first thing obviously is choosing a license, and more on that soon. Um, second thing is making sure that the text of the license, that is the agreement between you and the users, um, is in a file. It can be in a file that is in the root directory of your source code. If you're, if you're only providing um, binary um, versions of your software, it should be accompanying the documentation. Likewise, in the documentation, you put, should put information about uh, your chosen license. So a good place to put it is in a readme file, because most people will look at that first. Um, but also put it on your website and in other forms of documentation if you have them, particularly user documentation. If you want to go uh, for the full um, kind of, uh, uh, sort of detail, then the other thing you can do is put the license information and the copyright information in all of the files as well. That's not strictly necessary in most cases, but it does help if you want to find out, uh, if you want to kind of give developers um, a really clear indication of what license you use. Uh, and in particular, it's useful if you are licensing different parts of your software under different licenses. So if you're using multiple licenses, I would do that last step as well. But it's really quite easy. You're effectively saying, choose a license, and then put that text um, into somewhere where people will see it. And that's really all it is. Um, so when people get worried about how to apply licensing, um, it's actually not very difficult. So some general tips to, uh, to kind of deal with licensing. If you're using a commercial license, get it checked by someone who is a lawyer. Um, because what you're entering into here is contract law, and every time you create a new commercial license, um, you are look going to, to, to do something where you may be introducing clauses that have a meaning that you did not intend them to do. Um, if you're using an open source license, use an, uh, a popular open source initiative approved one. And the reason for that is because those licenses have been checked over by lawyers. If you're thinking about academic um, or non-commercial license, think about what you're trying to achieve with this. Um, one of the problems with um, non-commercial licenses is that the, the kind of the um, dividing line between what is academic or non-commercial and what is commercial, has, it's very grey these days. So if you're using it for teaching nowadays, is that a non-commercial use? Some people would argue that's a commercial use because students are paying for uh, the privilege of you providing that. Um, some people uh, might, might say that a research organisation that only survives on commercial money um, but is a non-profit might be a commercial organisation. Um, so, the, so think about that and perhaps use a different way of licensing that achieves the same aims but doesn't have the same ambiguity. Um, if you're thinking about putting stuff into uh, the public domain, um, again, uh, perhaps think about using a permissive open source license or CC0 because it gives you more protection but achieves the same impact. Um, and the last one is never be tempted to write your own license from scratch unless you have gone through um, training and contract law. Um, it just isn't worth it. So, um, what I'd like to get onto now is probably the thing that most people will be interested, which is the different types of scenarios and what kind of licenses you might like to choose. Um, in this case, um, most of the scenarios I'm looking at here are open source licenses. Um, the, uh, there will be a lot of stuff around commercialization as well and exploitation um, and a little bit about uh, kind of 
other possible scenarios that you might bump into. Um, so one of the most common scenarios is really all you're wanting to do is um, allow anyone to use your code. Uh, so a good example of this might be um, that you have a piece of code that you're not considering to be particularly um, novel, um, but it does something that you might think people might find interesting. Um, one example of this might be you've published a paper and you want people to be able to verify um, your work, but in reality the main um, piece of novelty is your data set. Uh, you happen to have created a, a tool that helps people work with this, but um, you don't consider that to be the, the kind of primary output. So you might just want to let people use that tool easily. Um, the MIT license is the simplest of these kind of licenses that are very permissive. Um, it's very short, it's very to the point, um, and it basically lets anyone use your software as long as they say that you created it. So it has what's known as an attribution clause. Um, that basically says, if you use this software or if you change the software, you must give me credit. Um, the other good thing is that they can't hold you liable for uh, what your software does. So they can't come back to you and say this was really terrible, um, it calculated uh, the uh, numbers wrongly and as a result I've lost lots of money. It's basically saying use it at your own risk. Uh, there are some um, things that you, in the UK that you can't um, kind of uh, um, revoke your liability on, but in most cases um, the software you create will never be in those kind of categories. Uh, if you are doing something which you might expect to be used in life or death scenarios, that is where you should be a little bit careful. If you are, let me know, um, and I can talk about more detail uh, about that later. The main thing with these sorts of licenses is that it allows the software to be redistributed under other terms and conditions. So with the, if you use something like the MIT license, other people could take your software and then resell it um, or change the licensing terms as they like. You still have ownership of your own software, but other people can build on this however they like. And a lot of people really like this, and a lot of people really don't like this. Um, if you're worried about um, your organizations or your own name being used to um, promote products based on your code, then instead of the MIT license, you might want to choose the BSD free clause license. That has an extra clause that basically says, you cannot use my name to sell your products that are based on this software. Um, if you are worried about something called patent right grants, um, then you probably have been spoken to by your university's innovation office, um, uh, but there are licenses like the Apache license which basically put in very specific clauses around how patents um, are affected by the software. So whether or not you are giving people explicit rights to use patents that might be required um, to use the software, or whether or not you are allowing people to sue you um, because they believe there is a breach of one of their patents. So a lot of universities like the Apache license because it gives that additional protection. Um, Another common scenario is that you really care about um, improvements to the code being shared. So particularly here, you might have something where uh, you believe that this um, is going to be used for a period of time um, and that you are not going to be the only one who's going to be using this, but that other people will want to contribute and you want to make sure that when they make improvements or modifications that everyone else, including yourself, can see them. Um, so the most common license for that is something called the GNU um, General Public License or GPL license um, and we would, uh, we would say that the um, version 3 of this license is the best for this sort of purpose. Uh, what this says is if someone else takes your code and um, changes it that they have to make the changes available to everyone else. It also covers patent rights. Um, some people don't like this license because one of the things that it does is it basically makes everything that it touches um, uh, kind of have the same license. So, for instance, if you had another piece of code that was linking to it in a strong way, and I won't go into the, the details of strong versus weak linking, um, but 
uh, it, it means that the, the other piece of software also has to be licensed under the GPL license. Um, if you're worried about that, um, and in particular, if you want someone, if you're developing, for instance, a scientific library that you expect people to use in commercial applications, you might want to use the lesser GPL license, which basically says that changes um, to the code need to be um, provided back to the community, but anyone can, can use it in its a sort of like black box form um, to create products with. So uh, if they make improvements to that particular um, library, they have to feed it back, but they don't have to make uh, a piece of software that is based on that library um, open source. And then lastly, um, if you are developing something that you are trying to maybe sell as a software as a service, so you're providing it via a web server, um, you might want to consider something called the Athero GPL license, um, where that basically says you must share something um, even if it's used internally in a company or organization or being provided as a service. And then the last kind of uh, use case that a lot of people are interested in is I want to make some money. Um, I think the important thing to realize is that you can make money off of software no matter what type of license you choose. You can make money off of closed um, licenses, off of restricted licenses, and off of open licenses. Uh, it's harder to make money off of um, uh, public domain because you no longer own it, but in every other case, um, you can try and exploit it for money. Um, so the obvious one is the propriety license um, where you're simply selling the software. Uh, but there are other ways of doing this. Um, so some companies have made a, a lot of money out of this idea of releasing a, a platform um, as open source such that many people can build tools, services, drivers and so on around it um, and sell those instead. Um, a good recent example of this is something called OpenStack, which is a cloud platform um, that mimics what's, uh, it basically provides an open source version of what Amazon's um, web services or uh, Microsoft Azure's platforms try and do. Um, and there's been a lot of commercial exploitation because uh, this is a very easy way for other people who are wanting to try and provide services more generally, uh, can use this and then sell their tools and services. Um, I mentioned dual licensing before. Dual licensing is basically saying that your software has two licenses and people can choose which license they choose to use. Um, so what you might have there is anyone can use it and can access it under a very uh, strong open source license that forces them to uh, feed the changes back, but they can also uh, buy a commercial license, which means they don't have to feed the changes back. And an example here, this is very common in the database world. So MongoDB is one of these kind of um, products where they use this dual licensing so that both, uh, so that anyone can use it, which means that lots of people start relying on the software, but that commercial companies can build products around it without having to be, uh, without having the same restrictions. Um, and then the last way that a lot of um, people exploit open software um, is to look at doing different types of additions. So you would have one edition which has a limited feature set and then another edition that is commercially licensed uh, that is uh, having an extended feature set. In all of these cases, when you're trying to exploit software, the key thing is understanding what you want the impact to be. So for all of these, this is really about business planning and understanding where you want different types of uh, user to, uh, basically the rights that different types of users will have over your software. Okay, so lastly, I'll go on to licensing versus governance. Um, so governance is the thing that stops a project from descending into chaos. Uh, it is the ground rules for decision making, participation, communication and sharing. And one of the reasons I like putting this topic into this talk is that thinking about what I've asked you to do um, with regards to um, software licensing, all of those things are much easier to do if you have an idea of what your governance model is. So basically, how are you making decisions? So governance is about making decisions when you're developing software. And to choose a software license, you need to make various decisions. Um, there is um, 
something that a lot of people kind of confuse, which is the difference between an open source license and an open development model. Um, open source software philosophy kind of merges the two. Some people are really passionate about making sure that people can get uh, access to the source code um, for the software. Other people uh, are really passionate about understanding how people can contribute to a project. And the really interesting thing is that that second part, what I will call the open development processes and models, uh, contain a lot of really useful um, guidance for all sorts of software projects, not just um, open source projects. So basically, you know, not all open license software is produced openly. Um, for a long time, the Linux kernel was a very good example of that, where the decisions were really being made by a very, very small group of people. Um, uh, not uh, all, kind of like, uh, there, there are quite a few closed um, licensed software which benefit from the types of uh, things that have been popularized in open source projects. Um, and the last thing to remember is that many open source contributors um, are paid in some way to do so. So if you're thinking of open source models and open source licensing, um, you should be aware of the fact that uh, a lot of people think of this as if you open source your software, you will get free effort from all of these people who want to contribute in their spare time. That's rarely the case. What you're looking for is looking at the governance models that gives them the incentives to do so. Okay. Um, I have more slides on this, but I think um, the only thing I want to point out is one thing that's a really good resource is this um, freely available book called Producing Open Source Software by Carl Fogel, uh, which goes into a lot of the different practices around how you can uh, deal with the business of, of managing a, a software project. Um, it talks about things like how you communicate decisions, how you make decisions, um, how you release software, how you assign responsibility to different people. And I think it's a great resource um, if you're interested in improving the way that you're developing your code. And I would say it's a really good read if you are going into the larger projects that um, I will characterize as having more than three people, well, three or more people um, working on the same um, piece of software. Okay. So, um, the takeaways I have for you then, um, in terms of uh, what you need to know about software licensing, are basically, firstly, understand who owns the IP to your software. Is that you? Uh, is it your university? Is it another organization because you are part of a large consortium um, that is working towards building a piece of software? Identify if your software already incorporates any existing licensed code. So what I mean here is, are you using any libraries? Um, uh, have you copied code from someone else at some point? Um, perhaps a collaborator has said in an email, I know how to fix this problem. Here's a code snippet. Um, let's put that in our code base. Do you know where that came from? Um, Third one is decide what impact uh, you're seeking. So understand whether this is mostly about making your code available to others, whether it's about research integrity, whether it's about making money, whether it's about building your reputation. Um, then choose an appropriate license based on this. Uh, and um, there are many different resources that you can use to help do this. Uh, in particular, there are different um, there are different narratives that you can see from different communities about why they have or haven't chosen a particular type of license, which is really interesting. Um, make sure you apply it by having that text uh, in your documentation. And then put in place a governance model which supports contributors and enables impact. So what I mean by that is your governance model, the way that you um, make decisions, should support what you've been trying to do um, in your choice of software license. So if you know what the impact you want to have uh, is, choose a way of making decisions that supports this and encourages this. Um, and if that's all that I want you to take away, there's one last thing as well, which is if you think that you don't understand something, go out and seek help. 
because there are a lot of people there who can give you that help. Um, I'm sure um, people in Cambridge would be delighted to, to have a chat. Um, uh, it's, imp it's particularly important as we start getting into uh, a number of the things that are changing in scholarly communications. So, for instance, now it's becoming much easier to put your code up on um, sites like GitHub, for instance. Um, so research, uh, when we look at how uh, researchers are publishing their code, a lot of them are using GitHub. GitHub provides um, a really good tools and documentation for how to choose a license. Um, uh, if you're putting it into a repository, uh, I went to see whether the Apollo repository at Cambridge can accept software. It can. That's excellent. Um, one of the pieces of metadata uh, that uh, you can provide there is the license. So again, um, there might be a reason that you're wanting to do that because you're wanting to get a DOI for your software. Um, and in doing so, you'll need to think about the license conditions. Um, and then the last one uh, is some of you may have seen that over the last couple of months, um, some of the big journals have started making shifts in their policies around code that is um, being uh, used to create research publications or research data. So Nature recently um, said that they would be encouraging all journal editors to uh, look at um, guidance, uh, applying guidance for authors uh, that says how to provide software um, and encourages them to basically say that uh, if you're uh, publishing a paper with them that uh, has used software in some way, that that software should be supplied. Um, so the really great thing there is that they're providing the guidance to authors. One of the things it says in that guidance, there's only three things in there. One of them is, has it got a license? Um, uh, likewise, Science um, and their suite of journals have said the same thing, but they're going even further. They're not just sort of encouraging people. Um, for some of those, they're saying that um, it is mandatory for people to be providing the code. Uh, and again, one of the things they put in their guidelines is, what's the software's license? So you'll start seeing this more and more, and the big takeaway here is be prepared for it, understand what you want to do, but don't be afraid to, to ask for help. So, thank you very much. Do people have questions? Or, yes? Um, you mentioned a strong versus weak um, yeah. you know, code. Uh -huh. Can you explain <laughs> Okay, yeah, so I, I realized that possibly I should have just not mentioned it at all. Um, so uh, this, this applies to the way that um, you might interpret what const uh, constitutes a piece of software. So um, here's an example. Uh, you create a library that implements a particular algorithm. Um, let's say, I don't know. It reverses, it reverses the order of a set of, of numbers. Uh, I have a piece of software that um, needs an, uh, a library that um, uh, does exactly what your library does. You've licensed your software under um, something like the GPL, which basically says that uh, any, any software that is derived from your software must also be licensed under the same license, i.e. the GPL. So the question becomes how the law interprets uh, that linkage. So if, you're so if I just copied your code into my software, that would clearly be deriving um, my work from, your, from yours. So then I would have to apply the GPL to my code. Um, but for a library, it's a little bit harder because um, depending on the programming languages, um, there is the question of whether or not that's the same piece of software or two separate pieces of software. Most people think now that if it's a, if it's a completely separate library, then that is probably a completely separate piece of code. But one of the reasons why the lesser GPL became um, available was that people were worried that no one knew how this would be um, dealt with in courts. Um, so if you are worried about that, the lesser GPL makes it much clearer and sort of says if it's being used as a library, that is not considered the same piece of code. So, that's, so when I talk about strong and weak linking, it's actually to do with how different programming languages uh, incorporate code that they're importing or calling. 
and it turns out to be a legal minefield um, that I'd be happy to point you to, paper, uh, to kind of court cases on, but I suspect you do not want to read. <laughs> so, yeah. No questions? Yeah. Um, if, you, if the, your employer owns your IP, mm -hmm. then can you distribute the software on the GPL? Haha, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, so it depends on a number of different things. Um, so, for instance, uh, so this is, where, this is where it will matter whether or not you are being project funded or you are being sort of centrally funded um, by your university. So for a lot of research funders now, um, they are starting to put in place um, guidance that says that uh, code that's being developed um, sort of um, by default should be open sourced. Uh, and you should say what sort of license you're going to use in the grant proposal unless you have a reason not to. Um, and there, if you are project funded, I would go back to the original project grant to find out whether there was a clause that was uh, there that said that you would be releasing things under a certain um, license. And indeed, that's a good way of, if you would like that to happen, to get the leverage to do so because... Um, uh, in my experience, universities don't like turning down uh, grant money just because they want to apply a particular sort of license on the outcomes of that grant. So if, the if you sort of say the funder has said that it's fine to GPL my software in my, in my grant, uh, most universities will say that's fine. Um, come and talk to us about exploitation on another time. If you are centrally funded, um, that starts getting a little bit trickier and... I think here this is where you need local knowledge. So you need to understand what the policies that are in place perhaps in your department, um, within the university centrally uh, are, and that's where um, speaking to your innovation office may help. Um, speaking to the people in research data management will help uh, to try and understand what are the possibilities. Um, in many cases, um, so I know at my university, for instance, uh, it is a case of talking to our research innovation office and making a case for why I would want to choose a particular license for the software. They will kind of run that past their particular checklist of what the university seeks to do in exploitation. And if I persuade them that, it, it, that basically they would gain more from applying a GPL license than a standard propriety license, then that's fine. So, Other questions? No. Stunned people. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. Um, you said about people changing their license, their mm -hmm. changing their license. What kind of effect does that have on the validity of people's data license? Right, so that's a good point. So, specifically talking about open source licenses, uh, one thing that you, you can't do is take back um, a license. So uh, let's, let's again kind of like use the example of the wonderful library that you've produced. Um, so you've produced the library to, to sort things into reverse order um, and at a later date um, you decide to relicense your library. Um, so you're, you're within your rights to do this because you have the, the ownership of the IP on this. But anyone who was previously using your um, software under an, uh, the old versions that were licensed under the other license is still free to do that. What they don't have a claim on is any improvements that you then make under the new license going forward. So maybe you then kind of add to your library something that says, uh, now we can also sort it into a random order. Um, people couldn't take that code and say, well, you, uh, you gave us the code for the other stuff under the old license. This new code is also under that. Um, the other um, slight issue is when you have multiple authors from different organizations. Um, so as you get more and more contributors to a project, more and more authors, the, what constitutes ownership over the software gets more complicated. Um, so uh, to change the license, you need the agreement of all of the owners of the copyright on that code. Um, so there are typically two different ways that people get around this. Um, one is to have one organization holding the copyright for all of the code and people who contribu contribute from other organizations sign over that. Um, this works very well in the open source community because in return what they get is, is through the open source license, um, a, 
uh, right to continue to use the code that they have contributed. So basically, if they trust the organization which is taking the central um, control over the code, then that's fine. And in general, universities, it's quite often in the hands of a foundation that might have been created, are very they, they, they um, are generally trusted, um, so that's okay. You can also do it with closed source code. So um, you can do exactly the same thing and have one organization um, holding the copyright. Um, in that case, you want to have a contributor agreement that encapsulates what the person gets back, which might be something like a, um, a non, basically a non-exclusive, um, in perpetuity, royalty-free ability to use that software or that version of the software so that basically by contributing the code to another organization and relinquishing their rights they still get the ability to use the code they've contributed for all time. Yeah. Questions? No, it's, it's, it is two o'clock so um, thank you very much for coming along uh, as I said I'm happy to take questions outside if you have more questions um, and please do uh, contact me by email if you have anything you want to follow up or indeed if you would like to use these slides and give your own talks elsewhere. So thank you. <laughs>